Hello everyone, just give me one second to figure out the technicalities. All right, I believe now you should be able to also see the slides and the presentation itself. Um, so thank you all. Welcome to the ITSM Congress. Thank you for joining my presentation on negotiation strategies, do's and don'ts, a small gu guide on how to negotiate better deals. To give you a short introduction, my name is Miriam Haas and I'm a procurement consultant at the GNE. I am German, but I thought that especially for our international ent attendees, it might be interesting to have an additional vendor that presents in English. Let me give you a short introduction on who the GNE is. So the GNE is a consulting company focused not only but also procurement and is located in Stuttgart. We have assisted medium sized and large corporations in all questions regarding procurement, processes and tools over the past 20 years. During that time frame, we have developed our core competencies, which are the following improving procurement departments, taking on interim management, the procurement of outsourcing services, assisting the entire tendering and negotiation process along those lines, as well as training individuals and employees. So moving forward, what are actually negotiations? So what, what is it that we're talking about? Um, it is important to notice that, you know, as, as you've seen, the topic differs quite a lot. Um, so what brings me here is that negotiations are value adding for all attendees that run a business. So whenever there's a business, it's omnipresent that there will be negotiations. However, negotiations are probably not one of the first topics or skills that you think about in the connection to ITSM. And it's our experience as a consulting house that within the IT field, there is a vast room for, for opportunities and improvements um, within the negotiation skill. As industry professionals are not getting appropriately equipped to deal with this topic. Negotiations is a skill that offers the opportunity to reach better deals and doing that faster with less conflict. Often individuals are not considering that negotiations take place in more instances than just the MSA or SOW. Classical example in the field of ITSM are, for example, the um, SLAs, so the service level agreements, as well as the service meetings where the same tools and strategies can be deployed that you know from the classical business negotiation. Another element that finds application regardless of the context is crisis management and conflict resolution. So let's take it back a bit for our baseline and our understanding. What are negotiations? For today's context, negotiations can, can be simplified. So whenever there's two or more parties um, needing to reach a joint decision but have different preferences, they negotiate. So within this very simple definition, you can already see that there's a few core elements. So for example, we already see that there is a need. There's a need to achieve something on both sides. And in this context, it's the need to come to a joint decision together. And what is between them is different preferences. So thinking about time, money, availability. So going further, let's let's include that into the next point that we're going to talk about. So when is the right time to negotiate? As in life, there's a good time and there's a bad time. So the right time to negotiate is generally um, when, when you've spent enough time um, and effort and the requirements are laid out. Um, so here, get together with the appropriate department, map out the essentials, have the service description ready. And then once all those important points are already clear to all parties, you can start negotiating, not before. Another important factor is that one should only negotiate when your negotiation partner actually has the authority 
to make binding concessions and agreements because nothing is more frustrating and destroying the relationship than spending a lot of time and later finding out that um, the partner didn't have the right to actually agree to terms. In addition, when you are prepared and you already have thought out a strategy, argumentation, and also define your main goal and, and your ranking on what you want to achieve during a negotiation, that is the right setting to negotiate. So that obviously leads us to when not to negotiate. So there's reasons for not negotiating. And the first one is when internal costs of negotiations are higher than achievable savings. Put that in context, it's basically if you need to deploy a team of five or seven to try and negotiate a contract down, um, but the savings are very minimal and you've basically spent more money on your own internal resources trying to achieve savings than the savings are worth. So that would be a context where you wouldn't consider negotiations. So another reason, and that also has a bit of a cultural aspect to it, um, but it also works in just a European setting, really. So it is when a negotiation would send a wrong signal. So let's imagine you're getting into the negotiation um, and you receive a really fair offer. You would probably be surprised and you're taught that, you know, you should optimize, you should negotiate, you should get a better price, get a better quality. So what happens here is if you're already getting a really good price, um, that is, for example, below the normal market price, so the supplier is already offering it cheaper to you, which could be in good faith, start of a new relationship or a preferred customership the supplier is running and then you try to negotiate the price further down the relationship can get very sour because you either signal to your supplier then that you do not value his service or that you actually do not know the proper market prices for the services which then also makes you look like not a good negotiation partner um, there's another reason, and it's a bit controversial, but you should also not negotiate when you are in a weak negotiation position. What I mean with that is, imagine you have a supplier and they are in a monopoly position and they know it. So you need their resource. Um, they're quite aware of it, that there's no way for you to not make a deal with them, uh, which puts you in a very weak spot argumentation wise. Um, and here, open communication is key. So in those situations, it's beneficial to give up the little power you have, start an open dialogue, and address that you do have preferences, um, but you are looking to make a deal and not overcomplicate the proceedings. Because the supplier also has to deploy resources here, manpower, um, so it can get quite costly also for you know, a strong supplier or the stronger negotiation partner, if you are acting in what he would perceive as a difficult manner. So here open context and saying, listen, I'm here, I want to make the deal. I'm aware of my position, let's work on this because deals are also made between people. Um, it's important to address that you are giving up the power you have, but you do expect then to be treated fairly maybe next time get a bit of a reduction. And lastly, um, when your BATNA, I'll get later a bit more into those terms, it is basically the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Um, so it is the best offer you have on the table from another supplier, it can be in-house production that is actually better than a supplier's offer. Um, so if your BATNA is already better than what a supplier is offering, for example, um, then you wouldn't waste the resource on negotiating that deal because there's quite a good chance that the supplier, even with the best offer they can give you, is not matching the offer you already have ready available on the table. And time is a valuable resource and also something that is saving costs. So let's talk a bit more about negotiable elements. I've mentioned price quite a lot, and I can imagine that in this IT context, there's obviously more to negotiate about price. 
as I mentioned with the SLAs as well as the service meetings, there is a, a couple of other key factors that are driving those negotiations. So within IT, um, it's quite special because more elements come up. Usually you would say as a rule of thumb that every contract has at least five negotiable elements. Um, I've put here in some elements that are typical for the IT field. So price is obviously important. So are KPIs, quality, service cuts, which would be relevant in IT here, the duration of the contract, contract extensions, timeline, time of the deliverables, deliver delivery and the delivery format, as well as payment terms, after sales services and maintenance agreements and everybody's favorite <laughs> liabilities and penalties. So this is a short list of all the elements that you can negotiate. Um, so keep in mind, even if you're, let's say you're only interested in price, KPIs and liabilities, um, you can give up a bit of the position you have on those other elements to receive a better bottom line on the points you really care about. Um, but I like to stress that out because for people that don't do negotiations on the daily or um, haven't had training, it's sometimes a bit hard to see that there's so much more that could be negotiated about um, or that for a supplier, for example, it's not clear that for him, um, you know, it seems like you're paying really fast when in real it's actually how you do your business and you can still use that then to your advantage in the argumentation. So now that we've talked about negotiable elements and something that goes a bit further than price, I would like to move on to understanding offers. So what we've come across is that um, offers can get really complex. So but once it's only price, it's, it's quite all right. Um, but we already mentioned that preparation is key. And there is things you can prepare before a negotiation. And with all the information that you should have, before starting a negotiation, it's going to be quite easy to figure out those elements. So earlier I mentioned that we will get on to um, defining some standards. I already mentioned the BATNA, which is the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. We have the reservation point, also called walk away point, um, which is the minimum acceptable term or terms that a negotiator is willing to accept before he or she ceases to negotiate and walks away. So an example here is it can either be a single item, um, obviously price, um, delivery, and, and let's say liabilities are, are often a factor here, but it could also be a combination. It could be that the quality, the service, and the price do not work out for you in this combination because you don't have the budget for it or other way around it's not profitable anymore to do the business um, or you just have simply from your own business standards liability restrictions or quality restrictions and you cannot make a deal lower than any percentage or any number and now lastly and potentially the most important one or the one that negotiators like to focus on and um, it is the most helpful one, I'll later illustrate a bit more and then it becomes more clear to you, is the ZOPA. So that means the zone of possible agreement, which is the range where both parties can make a deal. And both of the parties can actually make a deal that benefits both of them, but there is some way and there's different ways on maximizing, let's call it profits, get your favorite items, whatever you want to call it, there's a way that you walk out at the end of the day with a better deal than your partner, or at least get everything you want if that ZOPA exists. Therefore, it's important to identify it. And I've mapped out five steps. Um, it's a really easy guide that will help you achieve that. Um, so with the negotiations, we said it's important to understand offers. For knowing what an offer means to you, you also need to understand your position. So let's start with the BATNA. So in order to evaluate your BATNA, um, it's key that you list all the alternatives you have on the table. So alternatives are, for example, 
what would it cost me in-house to do it? What other offers did I receive from suppliers? What other offers are out there that I know of? Or if we reverse the roles for a second, um, if I am actually trying to sell my product, do I have another vendor that can take it? Do I have another vendor that's close? Do I have another vendor that I have a close relationship with that paid before? So you can get a BATNA out of an actual offer or really just an alternative like in-house or not doing the business at all if it's not a key business. Um, so you list your alternatives. Then moving forward, you evaluate those alternatives. So we've mentioned just different negotiable elements um, and with every or with most orders, purchases, there's more than price to it. So you should have already identified what's key for the service or product. Um, so do an evaluation metrics, say price accounts for 30%, quality 20, delivery time 10, um, liabilities issue five and whatnot. Put those alternatives in that you have and now for yourself, but you can also really use it in the negotiation, um, put them in and then identify what the best alternative is. So it might not be the best price, but it might be the one that is fastest or well known, easiest to implement. If that means more to you, then identify it. So now, obviously you also need to know how far can I negotiate? So what is my business telling me? How far can I go on liabilities? How far can I go to quality? How far can I go to maintenance? What percentages are allowed? And also what is still profitable? So figure out your own reservation point and what it would take basically for you to walk away from the deal because you're saying, I cannot do this or there's no value in it. And then look the other way and try to think how the supplier is feeling. Um, so look at, hi at him and usually if it's a business partner that you've had a long-standing relationship with or that is well known in the industry, you kind of know what potential alternatives he has. So think about what would happen to him if he didn't make the deal with you. And then we're continuing and we're trying to figure out the reservation value of the supplier. Now, I'll later get to assumptions within negotiations. Here, I don't mean pick a value and say, okay, he walks away if I say 200 euros or if I say 99.5%. Um, try more to think in terms of showstoppers. So try to identify the elements that would make your supplier walk away. So find out the hard issues. And sometimes your partner is not very open about it. Um, so try an open communication. You can say, I'm trying to find the best deal for us. I'm trying to understand your position. What item weighs heavier for you? And with that, you can get an idea where there's kind of pitfalls around the negotiations because we've all been in negotiations um, where along the lines a couple of days later you find out the supplier has a totally different take on what's important what's a showstopper and then when you've done all of this try to find the magical sopa which is the room that you want to be in and work in so between the seller's reservation point and the buyer's reservation point is the ZOPA, which is the zone of possible agreement and where you need to be. So if you look at it, this is a very simplistic one. I can imagine a lot of you thinking right now, but wait, often we have more than one issue. You can also make a graph like that for multiple issues. Important is that all of the different elements need to align at some point because otherwise there is no chance to make a deal. Um, I know this sounds very easy because usually you're not 100% aware of the SOPA, but try to map it out as best as you can. Just you get an understanding of, of what numbers, what percentages, um, what liabilities, penalties you're talking about. So for multi-case issues, you can also use it. It gets a bit more complex, but it's also really easy then for you to see 
where you can still move or not on either your own issues or the issues that you've evaluated the supplier or buyer has. So moving forward, um, there's a couple of points you should avoid um, mistakes in negotiations that can be observed quite often. And here I'll also give examples to, to make the context a bit easier. So don't make assumptions um, about values, prices, cutoff points. Here I mean unfounded assumptions. Um, if you had previous business dealings, if it's a very clear market price, um, or if you've actually found out credible information through open communication, then that's not a assumption, then that's educated and all right. But don't go into a negotiation thinking you know everything the supplier wants or likes. Try to really ask questions and get there. Um, the other one is emotions. So this one is, is easier said than done. Don't get caught up in emotions. Um, within negotiations, it is always about the issue, the problem, not the person. And the thing with emotions is they're often mirrored. So if you're laughing, the other person is laughing. So when negotiations get a bit rough, um, the tone, the emotions get also rougher and men and women respond differently to those changes in emotions. But you can be quite certain that whatever you're feeling is going to be mirrored and um, reflected back to you. So in your own interest, try to stay calm approach topics logically. If you feel like it's getting too heated, don't be afraid to take a break um, because conflicts do happen and it's it's fair enough. It happens in negotiations. It's all about how you deal with those conflicts because you can resolve conflicts in a manner that both parties are happy later on. Um, don't go into a negotiation and have an all or nothing attitude. As the word says, it's a negotiation. Um, so if you're sitting down at the table, be also willing to make concessions, have a dialogue, understand the supplier or buyer. Um, don't give something away without a return. So I just mentioned concessions. If you're making a concession on an item that's not that important to you, um, let the supplier know that you're doing him a favor right now. So you don't need to get, you know, an immediate return, but point out, hey, you know, I moved down, up, left, right, here a bit. Let's let's remember that um, in the upcoming days. Um, then don't make unreasonable demands because you will lose credibility um, because the supplier could think that you're not really aware of, of how the market grows, actual prices, or that you're just not very reasonable as a person itself. And um, within smaller niche markets, you will mostly encounter the same salespeople, the same negotiators. So losing credibility um, is more harming than it than it sounds um, when somebody just mentions it. Don't rush a negotiation. I know that's a difficult one um, <laughs> because often when it's time to negotiate, the timeline is already a bit behind. Um, but you're also not building a house and then later leave out the furniture. So to make deals work, negotiations are important, liabilities, everything needs to be mapped out and take your time. And if it becomes a reoccurring issue, then maybe something in the planning of the organization has to change um, because it is easy to, let's say, yeah, break the relationship in a rush negotiation and it's very hard to rebuild a negotiation or a contract later on. Um, so just make sure you give yourself enough time. Don't dwell on a high anchor, either remove it immediately or ignore counter it later. Anchoring is, call, is a called when you walk into a negotiations and you immediately set your claim. Um, because the more often that claim gets repeated, it becomes reality in the heads of the people. Um, so maybe the counterpart then starts repeating your own numbers and then they're just magically there, even though they might not be founded on truth. Um, so if that happens to you, either say, I don't want to talk about numbers right now, let's get back to it later, um, or just ignore it. So with offers, you can say, listen, I would first like to get the facts straight, get back later to it, refer to rate cards. 
then when you make offers, don't use the word between or range. Um, it never works in your favor because you will always get taken up on the lowest range or lowest value for you that you agreed to by giving a range already. So it, it's not a favorable way of saying something. It, the attention is to be nice and say, hey, I can move. But depending on who you're negotiating against or with, um, it, it could be a bit of a pitfall. And then moving on to the do's in negotiations, which I think, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it works in business, it works in, in IT negotiations, and it's really something to take to heart. Um, prepare. Preparation is key for negotiations, um, not only so you know what's happening or that you can, you know, involve the corresponding department if you're not 100% sure on the services or what, what demands are behind it, but also it makes the feeling of the meeting different. Um, everybody likes going into a meeting and actually having the feeling that the topic is of equal value to the other party and they've taken the time to prepare and it's much easier. Then to continue, um, follow the Harvard approach. Some may, might have heard it, I dropped it earlier. It is um, be hard on the problem and soft on the people because nobody wants you harm you don't really want to harm anybody let's say in the beginning of a relationship um make sure relationships don't turn sour so yes be hard on the points that you want but be reasonable with the person they're not sitting there and trying to make you angry they have their own so Try not to get offended easily and also in your communication, um, make sure you communicate that uh, often it's thrown around. Oh, this is ridiculous. Oh, um, you must be crazy, which is already a hard way of of talking, but make sure that you're talking about the numbers and not the behavior or the person. Um, then, yeah, a lot of times people try to negotiate the potential showstoppers and hard topics first, um, which is not advisable. What you should do is really start with the easy topics. Uh, start with the topics you know you can agree on. Um, just, you know, if it's if it's a contract that's ending, you want to prolong it for another three years, the other party as well, mention it, hey, we're happy to prolong it for three years. Just you can already then feel like, OK, you're both in this together. You're working towards a common goal. There's an agreeing atmosphere and you can already um, resolve some issues rather than starting on the hard topics, putting a pin in it, uh, getting back to it five days later. And because in multi issues, uh, multi issue negotiations, everything is connected. You will then have to renegotiate all the other topics. So really start with the easy ones. Um, do listen to the counterpart. Sometimes you do get information, you do get tendencies or, or intent that you don't necessarily get from an email, a piece of paper. Um, so try to be open to creative solutions. Sometimes the supplier would like something. Uh, for example, if I think of something practical, it's using your brand name. If, if you're quite a big company, then they profit of mentioning you as their customer, they can maybe ask, you know, if you also put them on your website as a supplier. Um, so that that means a lot to small companies or companies that are looking for that, which is a creative solution. And then maybe, you know, get a bit more um, room on price. Um, so keep in mind the creative side. Then rephrase and summarize statements. So if you're not 100% sure what the person has said, or if, if it's hard for you to follow because um, you're not 100% in the topic, or it's just not the same communication style that you have, just rephrase. Summarize what the person has said. Do I understand correctly? You mean point A is relevant because B and C needs to change because of that. Then the person has the feeling that you're actively listening, actively understanding, and also trying to work with them rather than just sitting there for an hour and 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 listening. Um, so that's quite effective. It also has a psychology psychological effect of uh, with each other rather than against each other. Um, 
when you structure argumentation, and that is especially important if you negotiate with um, people that are from another generation or another gender or culture, not everybody reacts equally to logic. Um, you know, some people are really into numbers. Numbers are all that matters to them. There's other people that react more to emotions or ethical reasons. So you don't have the time to always figure out, oh, how does the other person tick to that extent? So just structure your argumentation that they have a logical element, um, that they have an emotional element, something like, oh, I would really like to do this for you, but I simply cannot. So signal them that it, to some degree, pains you that you cannot give them what they're asking for, or ask, how am I supposed to do that? I cannot justify that in front of my boss. So everybody knows that feeling. And um, lastly, ethos, which is the ethical reason. So um, let's say maintenance contracts, uh, when they go up by quite some percentage, you can say, listen, this is uh, not industry conform. How as a small business, large business, should I do this? Where is the ethics behind dealing with me as a business partner like that? So if you structure argumentation in those three points, then um, everybody will take some point to heart. And then um, moving further, to it's important to take breaks. Um, if you're in a negotiation team, so it's not just you negotiating against somebody, but let's say you're three, four, five people, take a break realign, um, make sure you're all on the same page because it gets really messy and confusing when you're in negotiation teams and you realize that the other party doesn't really work as one. Um, then the last point on that is write down the agreements. So have a protocol, send it after the meeting, put a deadline in, here's the points, it is our understanding, we've agreed to this, if this is not true, please contact us. Um, so you're making sure that that is in then. So that what is, what, whoops, sorry, that was it from my side. Um, for questions, um, it's the end of my presentation and it's the do's and don'ts in negotiations, a small guide on how to negotiate better deals. So thank you for listening to my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them now in English or approach me right after the session at the speaker corner in either German or English. Um, we also, at our booth number 10, the GNE, on the exhibit floor, have more product information available on the service. It's in German. And um, please find me. Is there any questions you have right now? Otherwise, I would move to the speaker corner. Thank you.